Welcome back everyone to the Fedora Leads and Linux Distribution Development track. Um, and we're here today with Lucas Ruzitska uh, for a talk on auto testing in Fedora. So I'll hand it over to you. Uh, hello, my name is Lukas and uh, I work for Fedora Quality Engineering. And uh, today I would like to uh, give you a step-by-step -step guidance on how to set up OpenQA. Uh, I'm not going to go over the concept uh, much deeply because uh, yesterday uh, this was done by Adam already, so uh, those who were interested in it uh, basically know that uh, OpenQA is an automated test tool. Uh, originate, originally it was uh, developed by SUSE, uh, it still is developed by SUSE, but uh, Adam also adds some patches into it, so uh, Fedora also has some part of it now. And um, it allows to test various features of uh, operating system using the hands-on approach, like as if a user would do it. Uh, it basically creates and runs a virtual machine, uh, loads it either from an ISO file and a QCOW2 image, and uh, it then performs various actions inside the virtual machine, compares the expectations to the real state, and evaluates the outcomes. Uh, the OpenQA architecture is basically that there is a controller uh, that does the scheduling stuff and uh, the web UI and job handling and uh, uh, co communicates with the database and then there is a worker or there are multiple workers that uh, do the actual testing. So you can have many workers, you can just have one worker, it depends. Uh, for the local installation that we are going to talk about, uh, we are going to use one worker because I think it's uh, enough to consume a lot of our memory. So first, uh, we need to install uh, OpenQA. Uh, that's a fairly uh, straightforward process because everything is packaged uh, in Fedora. So basically, we use DNF to install the whole stack. And um, especially the packages like OpenQA, OpenQA HTTPD, OpenQA Worker, Python 3 JSON scheme, and Fedora messaging if you want to uh, consume the Fedora messages. But if you don't, you can omit the Fedora messaging, messaging uh, package. So to start with, the DNF install, OpenQA, OpenQA HTTPD, uh, and uh, the rest of the packages is a good start. And this will install the whole stack. So you will need like two minutes to do it, for example, which gives us 18 minutes left. Now, uh, when everything is installed, uh, we need to configure the HTTPD server. That's very simple too, because basically there are template files, template configuration files provided by the OpenQA packages, so we only navigate to etsy httpd conf point d directory and then copy the openqa conf template into openqa.conf and we copy the openqa ssl.conf template into the openqa ssl.conf and we enable the httpd can network connect connect for SE Linux and restart the HTTPD. Now basically, that's the first part. Uh, there were times, maybe two years back, when uh, the SE Linux cooperation was not that great, so it was recommended to switch SE Linux to the permissive mode but this is, not, this is not longer required. So you can operate on enforcing mode quite safely and without any issues. Uh, then 
we need to configure the web UI. The configuration resides in the Etsy OpenQA, openqa.ini file. And uh, basically, we need to do two settings to the file. Uh, under the global chapter, we find, or the global section, we, we find the branding, which Fedora recommends to set to plain. The other option being Suze, I believe. And if you wanted a nice chameleon, you can use the Suze branding. Uh, otherwise, it's totally the same. Just there is the quite nice logo of the chameleon. And uh, the download domains are federaproject.org. The authentication can have multiple modes, but for the local instance, the fake authentication is good enough, which basically creates a demo user and you will, you will control the web UI using the demo account. Normally on OpenQA production, uh, there is the open ID authentication, so you can use your FAS account to control the web UI if you have the rights and if, it, uh, if you have the permissions to do so. But for this local instance, we are not going to need it. Then we will install and configure our database. So DNF install PostgreSQL server and let's uh, initiate the database with the uh, PostgreSQL setup initdb uh, command. And uh, that's basically it. Now mm. OpenQA is ready to be run and uh, you can see that there is a procedure of several services that you should start. And uh, you have two options, basically. Either you enable them and uh, you make them start all the time. But uh, because I don't want OpenQA to run all the time on my computer, so I usually start them with a script. And uh, I believe they should be started in this order. Actually, I didn't start any other order. I have always followed uh, the guidance we have on the wiki page. So first you start the Postgred and HTTPD, OpenQA GRU, OpenQA Scheduler, OpenQA WebSockets, and OpenQA Web UI. This is enough for the Web UI to start and to make further settings, but at this moment, we are not able to do any testing yet. So uh, let me start the OpenQA for you. It's now installed. I am using the start openqa.sh script, which basically starts it in that order. And uh, now uh, you were able to see that it's unable to connect because the server wasn't running. But now when I hit F5, it still is not running. <laughs> How come? I don't want to debug that now. <laughs> so. Oh, let me. It might not. I don't know. Oh, yeah. It shouldn't be. Great. So now you can see that uh, OpenQA is running. Uh, that's the web UI. Now, yeah, it says HTTP localhost, yeah. So you go there, open it, you see the web UI, and uh, you click login, and uh, that would immediately switch to logged in as demo, right? And now uh, you find manage API keys, 
And I don't want to show you my API keys, so I'll switch to the presentation here. And uh, manage API keys. You click create to create the new keys and you copy the key and the secret uh, to some files I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, there is the expiration mark or radio button that you can check or uncheck. So uh, I didn't know about it or I didn't pay attention to it first and I was pretty much surprised after a year because uh, the expiration usually is one year. So after one year I was quite surprised that uh, it didn't want to start the tests and it claimed about uh, there is no API and uh, I was like, well, why, what's that? And uh, then I realized that the, that the key has expired. So uh, for uh, a normal use you could create a infinite API key that will never expire if you uncheck the expiration radio button. And uh, then you edit the etsy openqa client.conf and uh, under the localhost section, you copy the key and the secret. The secret is the, the second part of the key. It's quite visible in the, open, uh, in the web UI. And uh, that's it. We have installed and set up OpenQA to, to work. And when we start the worker, system CTL start OpenQA worker at one. So this will start the first worker and connect it to the, to the OpenQA. And now we are ready to run the actual tests. And uh, this can be done in 15 minutes if your uh, if your network isn't extremely slow. So, uh, which gives us five more minutes. And uh, that's downloading the tests. So, if I have dialogue, how long will it take? Pardon? If I have dialogue. <laughs> if you have a dial up. Uh, I don't think it's going to take you very much time installing OpenQA, but it's going to take you some big time downloading the tests. Would you say I'd be able to finish college? Uh, yeah, between you download the tests and, uh, and start it? Uh, from my experience, the problem is... Uh, I don't know how dial-up connections work nowadays, but uh, a year ago, uh, I, was, I have the LTE connection back at home, and uh, it wasn't the fastest connection in the world. I got problems with downloading the test repository because it's, it has, I think, 14 gigabytes, I think. Is it that much? Yeah. And... Uh, Okay, the LTE connection would have dropouts occasionally, so Git would complain about them and they, it stopped working. So this was a problematic thing to download. And uh, once I uh, had to head to the Red Hat office to download the repository. Uh, I know that you can use uh, the, depth, the Git depth one and you only download something, but it still is quite much because of the needles. And we are going to see what the needles are. So, I'd say my 56k modem is not going to be downloading at any time soon. No, it's... it's <laughs> <laughs> and to run any tests, you have to download Nitro as well. Actually, you don't need to download the tests to work with OpenQA, but in this talk, I am assuming that you can. Uh, because, uh, yeah, I, I will tell you a little bit later. So basically you go to a Packer repository and uh, you download the test uh, into uh, varlib OpenQA tests. Then you do the repository git clone you clone it as Fedora, 
and you change the ownership to Geeko test. Geeko test is the OpenQA user, and so that it has uh, rights and permissions in those OpenQA uh, test directories, uh, it's needed to give it the permissions. Uh, and then we have the tests. We have the tests, you can see it on the right hand side. Uh, but the tests are not loaded into OpenQA yet. So we will do it with the fifth loader tool. And uh, you can see that there are templates.fif.json and templates updates.fif.json, uh, which tell OpenQA a couple of informations. It will give OpenQA informations about the available machines, about the available products, and uh, about the available profiles, and about the test suites that it can run it. Uh, and to load it, with the fifth loader Pi application, it's a, a tool written by Adam, and it works wonderful, I must say, because before we had this, uh, the tests uh, and the machines and the profiles had to be defined by YAML file or in YAML files through the web UI. And, uh, when you made a slightest mistake in the YAML file, it would complain and never work. And th this fifth loader changes the game totally and now it's very easy because if you need to add, well, from the user's perspective, it's very easy actually. Because if you need to add another test, so you can just take a look how the test is defined and you copy the JSON section and then that's it, right? Basically. So you load it, the, the uh, slash C means clean all and the, uh, or uh, dash C means clear all and dash L means load, templates.fif.json. This will give you the basic Fedora tests. If you want to uh, load updates testing, then you use the second template with updates. And that's it, 20 minutes and everything is set up and ready. So uh, just some explanations. We will work with machines, tests group, images, jobs, test suites, tests and needles. So a machine is a QEMU based virtual machine basically. There, there can be different, but we are not using anything else, just the QEMU-based virtual machines. And you can set it in the machines section of the template file. So for example, the UFI x86 uh, underscore 64 is defined like this. So the, the, the architecture is 64-bit, the partition table type is GPT, QEMU CPU, number of CPUs, RAM, the VGA driver, and so on. UFI is one, which means true in Perl. So you also have the P flash codes and P flash wires to define the, the proper QEMU virtual machine here in this machine section. Uh, you don't need to define anything else unless you need something very specific. Uh, normally you would just use one of the available, which is either a BIOS or the UFI machine. A product is something, it, it's like a group of tests that run in the scope of, uh, of the uh, Fedora flavor. 
and it can be, for example, workstation, server, or everything, and then you, you put tests inside of these groups. So when you run the workstation, then it runs all the tests that are scheduled for the workstation, and it doesn't run the tests scheduled for server, and so on. And you can define this in the product section of the template file. So for example, the Web Fedora Workstation Live product is defined as this. So the distribution is Fedora, which is the entire thing. The flavor's name is Workstation Live ISO. And uh, then you have settings with variables telling the system that the desktop should be GNOME, that uh, it should uh, uh, use the install default upload uh, test uh, to actually create the installed uh, Fedora image. The HDD size should be 20 gigabytes. It should, be, uh, it should run out of the live. The package set is default and the test target is ISO. Uh, these are, however, user-made variables, so uh, you can use them in the tests. If your tests are, uh, could, should be structured without those variables, you don't need to define them. But our tests are structured around them, so we make differences in them uh, according to the desktop types, or for KDE, some specifics are used. Uh, and for GNOME 2. So uh, we usually have one test that can have various branches depending on what we need. So some branches switch on for KDE and some other branches switch on for GNOME. Uh, th this is how a profile is uh, defined in a profile section. And uh, this basically tells us that the Product Fedora Workstation Live ISO should run on a 64-bit machine, which is not UFI. The 64-bit is a BIOS machine. So these chunks are taken from the code. So this is exactly how you do it. And then you could define your own profile telling OpenQA that your section should run on a specific machine. And then there are test suites, and they define how a test or a group of tests will run, and it allows you to set the test variables to control the tests. So basically, you can use the variables that are defined in the machine. You can also use the variables that are defined in the product, and you can also use the variables that are defined in the test suite. And I believe the later you define the variables, then the, the more valid are they. So if you have the variable which uh, has the same name and a different value, so the test suite value would override the machine value. Yeah? Yeah, um, you can override that by pre... You can override that by prepending the variable name with a plus. It got very complicated because over time we've realized we need to sort of do things in different orders, but more or less, yeah, there's inheritance. Uh, normally, also, uh, it's good to mention that uh, on the production, the variables are pre-filled by the uh, OpenQA scheduler and by Fedora messages that are coming into it. Uh, when you run the tests locally, some of the, some of the variables are not pre-filled, so uh, the, tens, the test uh, might break, so then you need to fill in the variables, and we do it on the API CLI command, that, that's the best bet, I think, because you don't need to update the templates. So uh, what this means, basically, that there is a desktop terminal test that runs for Fedora Workstation Live on x86 and PPC64, uh, and uh, that it boots from the uh, hard drive the hard drive being the disk, uh, some flavor and machine variables .qcow2. The flavor and machine will depend on those variables being set 
uh, in the in the uh, in the machine, for example, or in the other uh, in the other test that runs before, uh, because let me show you the install default upload the deploy upload test called install default upload will basically install Fedora and upload the installed image uh, to the to the open QA and then this would start after the test deploy upload test so after install default upload and it would use the image created by the install default upload and now uh, the post install variable says just take the desktop terminal and run it there are several ways uh, how it could be done but when there is a test that should follow uh, the installation of the image then the post install variable is the cleanest way to do I think a needle is how OpenQA would recognize what is expected. Uh, we need to tell OpenQA what we want to, to do. So we define needles. Needles are PNG images with defined areas. So I decide uh, a small port some portion of the of the PNG and uh, OpenQA will look at it and it will try to compare it with what it sees inside of the running virtual machine and if it finds it it will do something about it it might click on it or it might just check that something like that is there and if it is then the, this tiny little test will be, uh, will be passed and if it doesn't see it, it will complain and it will fail. So you can, for example, check that there is a nice Fedora logo in the upper left corner using OpenQA by defining a needle with that logo. And basically the needle is two files. It's the JP, uh, PNG file with a screenshot there is a mistake here on the slides. Uh, it should be a PNG file with a screenshot and a JSON file with the area definition plus some other info. Uh, each needle consists of two informations, the area description and the list of tags. And it looks like this. So you can see that the tag is Evans about shown, which uh, controls that uh, the about window of the Evans application has been shown on the screen and uh, the specimen picture uh, will be taken from the Evans about shown, shown uh, dot png and uh, it would start on uh, x position 445 and uh, y position 286 uh, the area will be uh, 133 pixels wide and 146 pixels high. high. So this is like a, something like a square almost. And the type of the needle is match. Match means a visual comparison. And uh, that's what, what works. The, sometimes or I have heard, I have read in the documentation about the OCR needles, but uh, OCR. yeah, mythical OCR needles that uh, I was told during vlog that they work and that somebody uh, on Suze actually tests Battle of Westnoth using the OCR needles, uh, but uh, it seems that the code needed to run it is still not merged, so you need to patch the the open QA and I haven't had time to test it yet. Uh, when you want to write the test of your own, you don't have to. Now you understand everything and you can locally run all the Fedora testing stuck. But if you want to write a test, 
Uh, that's a Perl script that defines what you do inside of the virtual machine and what you want to expect. So you basically define some mouse actions, some keyboard actions, some uh, checks and evaluations, and uh, you can also evaluate script outcomes. So basically, you can test uh, some graphical uh, user interfaces, but you can also test uh, some CLI commands, and uh, all that will work. And tests uh, have various statuses, such as past failed, soft failed, running, and so on. If you want to create the test, you need to create a Perl module, put it in the tests directory of the OpenQA directory that we have created, having cloned the, the repository. And uh, you should use the libraries in the lib directory. You don't have to, but it's there. It's been already created. It's been already programmed. You don't want to reinvent the wheel, so you can check uh, what commands uh, the Fedora has made for you, and uh, you can use it. For example, if you want to do some login, uh, you can log into a, uh, into a console as a root, for example, so you don't need to program all the stuff and all the typing and all the checking, but you simply use the uh, login to console and uh, something like that, or uh, log in to the graphical, uh, graphical session, and uh, it's in the library, so you can just take it and uh, use it in your tests. And then you should probably study the test API, which is uh, the description of the commands uh, at open.qa API slash test API. Then uh, each of the tests should have a test header, which basically is what libraries or what other packages it uses. So uh, this will uh, tell me that as a base, uh, the installed test is used. Strict is the Perl thing, uh, which uh, keeps looking that uh, your code is correct and that uh, you don't do dirty stuff with it because uh, normally Perl doesn't check, for example, for, uh, uh, for um, how do you say that? Mm. Yeah, if you define a variable, so the namespace uh, should be limited to a subroutine, for example, or to the entire package, and uh, Perl normally doesn't check for it. Does it only support Perl or other languages as well? Uh, the tests are, should be written, well, are written in Perl. The whole thing is programmed in Perl, uh, but apparently, according to the documentation, the tests could also be written in Python. But Lovely. I have you, never you, tried. Using, using Perl makes it uh, dirty by default, doesn't it? Pardon? Using Perl makes it dirty by default. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, but the alternative is to go write your own app. It, I don't know if Perl would have been our first choice, but the other alternative is to go and write our own whole thing. And I don't know. I don't. Perl couldn't possibly be that bad than having to go write your own framework from scratch. And I, Adam will know more. <laughs> Yeah, just quickly, they, they have this crazy translation layer upstream, which I don't remember the details of how it works, but it uses some fairly janky stuff, and you can write a test in Python. And some team internally at Red Hat, I initially turned this off because I thought it was so hideous, but some internal team at Red Hat asked me to turn it back on, so it's now on in the Fedora packages. I haven't tried it myself, but it should work. It's using Perl to write tests is not that terrible because tests tend to use the functions from these libraries that are very, very simple functions and quite, quite well written. So most tests just tend to be strings of type this, assert this screen, then type this, then assert screen, and it's very kind of formalized. So you're not writing ugly Perl most of the time. There are a few cases where you write ugly Perl, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so for these tests, a lot of the tests, it's fairly simple, so it's fairly readable, yeah. 
Yes, Tim. You can write good Perl. <laughs> it is possible. It's just it doesn't care if it's readable or not. So it all depends on the person reading it. Um, so the tests that they're talking about should be reasonably legible. Oh, uh, for me, for example, I uh, doing this. I, I I saw Perl for the first time. But I somehow got used to it now, and uh, it's okay. But the, the, true, the truth is that uh, sometimes we fight over readability with Adam, because uh, uh, he is better at Perl than me, so he thinks it's super readable. And uh, <laughs> I think, like, maybe not. Well, if you work in the sewer every day, you get used to it eventually. <laughs> yeah. So uh, basically, if you use strict, it doesn't let you do uh, variable definitions with wrong namespaces, for example. Then use test uh, is that you should use the built-in functions, and use utils means that you use the basic Fedora library where most of the pre-programmed Fedora routines are placed. So Test API is the total basic. If you don't use test API, you will not test anything. And if you don't use utils, you will need to do a lot of typing. Then the test uh, file should have a subroutine called run. So this is basically a function where everything what you want to test is put. Anything else what's outside of the scope of the sub run subroutine run will only be valid inside of the test package. Uh, and then you add another subroutine, test flags, where you can define what to expect, what will it do after the test finishes, what will it do when the test fails, or if you want it to fail, because, for example, the flag, the fatal flag will tell that uh, if the test fails, then the whole test suite fails. But if you don't want it, because you have other tests inside of the test suite that do not depend on the first one, you don't want to make it fatal. Then <clears throat> you can ignore the failure, and that means that uh, it will ignore it and continue. Sorry. <coughs> You can set the test as a milestone, which means that uh, after the test finishes, the state of the art of the virtual machine will be uploaded to OpenQA again, and then the subse subsequent tests will be starting off that milestone. So this is, for example, useful. Okay, thank you. This is, for example, useful when uh, you want to test an application, and you don't want to do starting it all the time, but you would like to uh, take all the subsequent tests from a clean application. So we start the application. Once it's running, we will upload the state of the art to OpenQA, making it a milestone. And then we, for example, create a new file. And then I don't care what happens next, because the next subsequent, subsequent test will return to the milestone and again will start with a clean started application. So I, sometimes, that, that's good for example when a test fails and uh, the subsequent test would expect something what's not there because the previous test has failed. Uh, so uh, I can fight it with uh, this rollback. And uh, always rollback means return to the milestone. Uh, when you don't set any flags, then everything will be zero, I believe. And maybe, or maybe fatal will be. If you don't set any flags, I believe it will roll. If you don't set any flags, I believe it will roll back if a previous test module fails. Uh -huh. um, but it won't die because fatal's default is zero, I think. Yeah. I always use at least one flag so that I know that uh, what it should do, basically. 
And uh, there is a test example for desktop printing, so it looks like that, but I'm going to show you another test. Uh, these are the libraries that currently are available. So uh, it probably is self-explanatory, like modularity.pm would be functions that we use when testing modularity. Uh, Fedora distribution will be uh, functions specific to Fedora. Cockpit or Bugzilla, you know, it's, uh, you can expect what's, what's in there. What makes a library a library if you want to create one? Uh, it, it's another Perl package that starts with the package keyword. Uh, then you give it the name, like for example, package desktop tools. And uh, you use the base exporter and the use exporter, and then you export the variables using, for example, our uh, export uh, is start GNOME software and install application. This will enable the subroutines in this package to be used very easily without having to call anything else in the test files. Without exporting it, you would have to uh, call that like desktop tools, uh, colon, colon, and then start GNOME software, which is not very convenient. So it's good to export those functions. And um, now let's uh, take a look how we can create a calculator test, a very simple application test for a calculator. The test will be placed in the tests directory of the repository files or the repository directory. And uh, we can start, for example, by touching it. And uh, before we start to write it, we can register the tests in the templates to make sure it will, it will run in OpenQA because normally without the registration in the templates, it would not work, it would not start. Uh, bad thing Sumantro is not here because he's going to need this. <laughs> Hopefully he will see the recording. Okay, so the Test must be registered in the uh, templates and uh, you want to give it the architecture, the product and the variables. So basically you need to add a section to the test suites uh, section that has the name of the, of the test calculator. Uh, you will give it the profile where it should run. So this would run on workstation live ISO 64-bit machine, so it won't run on the UFI machines, just the BIOS machine, and uh, it will take the pre-installed uh, ISO, uh, it will run the calculator test, and it will run it from the disk flavor machine QCOW2. Uh, whenever you make a change to the template file, you need to reload it to OpenQA. So you do the fifth loader uh, c dash l templates dot fifth dot json. And uh, when we want to run this test from a pre-installed image, which is also possible, uh, we can replace some variables and uh, say that the HDD one is not something generic, but it's a specific one. It's the workstation.qcalc2, and uh, the user login is test, and the user password is weak password. And uh, now I am loading the tests uh, using the entry point system, uh, which allows me to put uh, a list of tests that I want to run. And uh, so I can start with graphical weight login test, which log logs me into the into the system, into the GNOME session, and then it runs calculator test. And again, uh, I need to load it using the fifth loader. 
So the basic syntax of the test file is this. We have talked about it. There is one more thing I wanted uh, to, to stress to you that uh, each test module must end with the one because each Perl module must return a true value which is uh, defined here uh, on the line with one. If you don't do it, it will complain and it will not run. And yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's problematic and uh, it bit me a couple of times in the beginning. So don't forget about the one. And uh, then you can create a subroutine that will only be valid for the test itself. For example, you want to repeat something a couple of times and you don't want to repeat yourselves. So you can define sub delete result, for example, and uh, say that uh, this result, this delete result subroutine will always press the escape key when called. So such a simple one, right? But then you can use delete result instead of send key escape. And uh, if this is more complicated, then you can save some time typing the stuff all again and all again. You could theoretically take this subroutine and place it into a library if it makes sense to you. And then we want to start the application. So in GNOME, normally we can hit the super key and uh, we do it with send key super. Uh, we type string calculator. The max interval 10 makes it type a little bit slow. Uh, in Fedora, you can find a wrapper for typing strings that is type safely or type very safely, but I'm not using it here because uh, I wanted to make it as generic as possible using just the test API commands. So the max interval makes the typing a little bit slower uh, so that uh, the GUI has time to respond and uh, the texts are really what they should be because if you type too quickly, sometimes letters are gone and then the, tests, th then the texts are incorrect and basically the, 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 the tests fail because of that, of the typos that are made with the engine. Then we send the enter key and we check that uh, the calculator has started. Assert screen means check that we see this particular thing in the screen. Then uh, it's merely some clicking. Assert and click would, make, would mean that uh, it checks that the needle is there, that there is the widget that we want, and if it's there, it clicks on it. Uh, you can uh, add the button uh, parameter to the command and you can define whether the button should be left, right or middle. If you don't do anything, it's left. So normal clicking is assert and click. Also, by default, uh, the OpenQA will wait 30 seconds until the widget appears. So if you think that uh, it should be there, in 10 seconds and you want to specifically check that it starts in 10 seconds, then you could define a timeout parameter and you could make the timeout to be 10 seconds. If you leave it out, it's 30 seconds. For some uh, tasks, you might need longer, so you can make it longer. Timeout 60 seconds, 120 seconds. For some installation purposes, it's maybe 400 seconds. Oh, no, we've got like 3,000. Oh, yeah, of course. For uploading tests, yeah, the, this is quite long. Uh, so basically, click on button 5, click on button add, click on button 7, click on button equals, and check that uh, the re result has been shown. So that's uh, one part of the test then we can multiply two numbers, but no clicking, just using keyboard. So we will type the string 
12 times 15, uh, max interval 10, we hit return or enter, and we check that the result has been shown. We delete it again, and then we can switch to the keyboard mode uh, using the Control alt k combo, sending the escape key, typing uh, a complicated string with brackets uh, that should basically be very clever about what to calculate first, you know, and uh, we hit enter and check that the result has been shown again. And that's it. We have the test now. We have registered it, so we can start it. Well, you have to take the screenshots. Oh, are you going to do oh that? yeah, I'm going to do it in it. So, uh, OpenQA Web UI now will show us everything about the tests, but it can't be used to start the tests, actually. Or at least I don't know how. So, you are using a OpenQA CLI command to, to make a an API call to the OpenQA server. And uh, basically, it's, it looks like OpenQA CLI API slash X, uh, dash X post uh, I, uh, ISOs or ISOs, and uh, you, uh, you use the file.iso, which is the ISO that you want to install. Yeah, just quickly to make this part a bit less scary possibly, there's a slightly higher level runner you can use if you're okay running on official Fedora images called Fedora-OpenQA, which is the same thing the official schedule uses. And with that, you can just, you can use it to just say, hey, schedule on this image from this compose, and it will do everything for you. But the trade-off is that it it can only schedule for official Fedora images, and it will need to download the image. So I think Lucas doesn't use that because it would take a long time to download the image on his system. So he's yeah. using a lower level interface to make it faster. I, I am using this because uh, I found it in the documentation. Okay. The first time I was trying to, to, uh, I was trying to uh, run the tests, and I used to it, of course, and th then I... I keep those, uh, those commands in a file, so I, I just uncomment the, the one I need and run it. So uh, you can pass variables also using, uh, using this command. Some of them must be passed, like distri, version, flavor, arch, and uh, build. Uh, Subvariant, desktop, and development are good for uh, installation tests. So if you have a pre-installed image, it's not that important. Uh, but if you want uh, the test uh, to install it, so it must know whether it's installing Rawhide. Uh, if it's being developed because uh, the development, for example, checks that there are some parts present during the installation, like the pre-installation warning or pre-release warning. And uh, if it's not there, so it uh, pretends that no pre-release warning is shown, but the pre-release warning is shown, and then uh, the, the test fails. So uh, these variables should be passed. And uh, then uh, it is uh, being scheduled, uh, and you can see it on the all tests page. So I will, uh, you can also see uh, the tests that, has, that have already run, whether they passed, which is green, whether they soft failed, which is yellow, or whether they failed, which is red. And uh, you can click on the dot to explicitly see the details of the tests. And then you, for example, see that uh, this is probably from the, it looks like the KDE start-stop test suite. So the ABRT started with some hiccup, aggregator started and uh, finished okay, and so on. Uh, test needle. Uh, when you click on, uh, on, the, uh, on the icon of the image, you will see uh, the screen that was recorded 
and uh, you will be able to see the area that was compared and if it is green, it was found and uh, candidate needles and tags tells you this was 100% K-mail runs and some number, which means this image from the virtual machine resembled 100% what we expected, so that's fine. Uh, normally, if you don't do anything, so by default, uh, it tolerates 4%, so when 96% is still there, so uh, the needle is taken as passed. If it's uh, less than 96%, the needle is considered not found. And uh, you can, of course, lower the bar a little bit and make it 90% or you could set it higher. It depends what you need. And uh, if there is an error, it's marked uh, in red and there is basically two red fields for every error and mostly uh, the error in one test, there is just one error because then the test finishes. So, but there are two places two screens. The first one is showing you where the needle was expected and not found. And the next one uh, gives you some information. That information uh, is a generic one for like this, test died, no candidate needle. And sometimes you could define your own strings. So you could basically get quite a nice information about uh, what happened in the, in the test. And I, Tim, I was thinking whether if we actually put some effort into describing those failures a little bit more exact, whether that could be used to train the artificial intelligence to make the prediction a little bit better. I don't know. Uh, if the test failed, you can restart it from the web UI, uh, that's the test detail page all the time. So there is a restart button and uh, you can stop it when it's running by pressing the stop button or you can just restart it when it's still running. Uh, dealing with needles, uh, so you add a missing needle using the uh, needle editor that is part of the web UI. Uh, you can define the area. You see that the green area here, so it's the needle defined for the P button on the calculator. Uh, you can name it and uh, check the name or select the name. It's above this, not part of this. And in the uh, upper right corner, you can change the match level so you can make it less than 96 or more than 96. So uh, it's good that if you don't want to uh, deal with the needles elsewhere, so you can just uh, write the test without the needles and you can create the needles with the first run of the test by using the developer mode that could be also switched on uh, in the web UI. Uh, I'm going to show it to you when the test runs. Uh, I am sometimes using the Needly application that uh, I sort of uh, wrote uh, when, uh, when I thought that uh, one totally needs a Needle editor that, it, that runs offline. And uh, it's quite good uh, nowadays because uh, it can connect to a virtual machine. So when you develop a test and you, may, you, make it vir you make it manually, you try it manually in a virtual machine so you could use the Needly application to take screenshots out of the virtual machine and you can create the needles offline without having to run OpenQA. So you can save some time because uh, creating needles in OpenQA is a little bit uh, 
a little bit slow, let's say, and it starts to be tedious if there are lots of needles because you need to open the test editor, you uh, edit the needle, you save it, then you have to click on uh, come back, then it waits for some time, then you continue the test and uh, it accepts the needle and it fails with another one, and then you r repeat the procedure. So when you feel like that, it's good to do this while developing the test and then you load everything into OpenQA and you only fix uh, what, what doesn't work. Uh, you can, okay, that's not important, but uh, you could use the Chancery application which is a very simple editor that uh, I also uh, wrote uh, as, a, as a sort of exercise in Python. And uh, this is good because it has pre-loaded test API routines, so you don't need to go through the test API, but you just uh, select what you want and it will give you the snippet in it, so uh, it can help. But once you know the routines, actually you don't need it anymore. Because then you just type the routine and yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, integration with Fedora, uh, of course, everything is based on Fedora. Everything is supported in Fedora. Everything is installable uh, from Fedora. Uh, we use it on a daily basis, so the Fedora testing stack is up to date and uh, should be working. Uh, we don't have breakdowns much because uh, our procedures don't allow to merge something that has not been reviewed. And Adam is a strict rev reviewer, so uh, his hawk eye will not let any problem pass into the into the production repository. So uh, if you want to test something on Fedora using OpenQA, it's very easy to do so. And uh, as I said, you can install it, you can set it up uh, in 20 minutes. Uh, there are some sources here that you can follow. This is uh, just for the sake of the of the recording, uh, or uh, I will upload the presentation on the SCAD, so then uh, you can take it and uh, you can see that there is the OpenQA documentation uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is maintained by SUSE. Also the test API documentation. We have the Fedora OpenQA install guide that this talk is based upon. So when you open that link, you will have a step-by-step step how to install it. And uh, the OpenQA auto inst repository that is used to load, to hold the tests and hold the needles is uh, on Pagier. Uh, thank you for attention, but uh, we still have not have the 90 minutes, I believe. So let me uh, show you how the test really runs inside of the open QA. Uh, yeah. So first uh, I need to show you the varlib open QA factory HDD directory where the images are placed. Uh, you can see that uh, there are lots of images, lots of QCOW images, starting with a number, and then disk workstation life ISO 64 bit dot QCOW2. So remember the product flavor variables that were in the test suite definition. So this is the disk workstation life ISO 64 bit. That's the part, and each test will create. Uh, its own image and the, the number is the test number to which the image belongs actually. When it's there, 
you could actually repeat the tests again and again and again because they have something they called an asset to start with. Once you delete uh, the underlying image, you can't restart the test anymore. That happens to me on production where I could come back. I, I would like to come back a couple of days and try, but uh, it's already deleted, so it doesn't work. But on uh, the local machine, until you manually delete those assets, you can still repeat those tests. Uh, so you can see that there is the workstation.qcow2, which will be used as a starting image. It's a pre-installed image, so I don't need to do the installation test before, because we don't want to waste time on 15 minutes Fedora ISO installation. Uh, you can say you can see that uh, the uh, it's owned by GecoTest. Uh, here you can make an exception. You can either make it uh, worldwide readable. Also, that will work too. But uh, but I do it. Uh, I always change the permission to to be uh, GecoTest because I think it's uh, it's cleaner that way. But uh, here in this directory, it's not that important. Uh, okay. Then uh, I will go to CD Open QA where I have the run test script. Uh, you can see that there are lots of them, the, those commands commented uh, out, and uh, I can select what I need and uh, so it's easy to start it this way. I like it sort of. And uh, I am going to start. You know, well, I realized actually that uh, it totally doesn't matter what is in the ISO variable if you use a QCOW image for the test. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. You, you could also you could also leave it out uh, in this case. So. Uh, Let's ignore the ISO variable. Its distri is Fedora, version is Rawhide, flavor is Flock, uh, Arch is x86-64, build is calculator test, sub-variant is workstation, and desktop is GNOME to make it safe. But I don't think we are going to need the GNOME or workstation uh, variables because we are not installing stuff. So, uh, I will run it now. Uh, now it tells me that uh, one test started, or one test suite started, zero failed. The ID number is 4158. It starts with zero, so you know how many tests I have run on this installation particularly. And uh, the product ID is 152, that's not important. Uh, and now when I go to all tests, I can see the calculator test running. 0%, uh, but uh, it, the, the, yeah, the progress bar is a little bit slow and it changes in steps. When I click on it, I get the live stream of what the test is currently doing. So you can basically uh, watch if it does what you want it to do. Here you can have the developer mode. So by clicking on it, you can switch it on and you confirm to control the test. And now, here you have fail on mismatch as usual, which means if the needle is there, fail. And if you leave it like this, it's like with the development mode off. So you can still have it on, but it doesn't affect anything. When you change it to assert screen timeout, then any time a needle is not found, it will 
give you the, op the uh, opportunity to open the editor and create it. So this is how you can create needles when the test runs. And uh, we are not using it in our test, but sometimes you can use check screen instead of assert screen, which returns a true value if the needle has been found. And uh, that's a specific thing, and uh, you can also make the development mode control the check needles. The problem is, if the check needle, for example, is not there on purpose, and you switch it on, then it will complain and it will force you to create the needle. Once you forget that it's, not, it's on purpose, not there, and you create it, then you will get some troubles later. So, uh, yeah. Now you see that the calculator, in the me that the calculator test has ended in the meantime, and it has passed, which is great. Uh, in the de on the detail page, I can see what the test actually was. Sometimes, uh, if you forget to sing the repo, you might be testing old tests. Uh, I am not developing in the OpenQA repository because it's, uh, th that requires everything to be typed with sudo. So I am developing a side and uh, sometimes I forget to push or pull and then it does the same uh, thing that should have already been corrected. So you can check that the test is what it should be because you have the test script here. Uh, you can see what steps were taken and what needles were compared. So for example, this one makes sure that the calculator has started and uh, it's 100%, which is great. Uh, sometimes when the GUI changes, so it might be 0% and then you need to recreate the needles, then it checks for the button 5 Again, it's 100%, and so on, and so on. Uh, you could see the variables that it uses to uh, run the test. So sometimes when you have a Fedora stack running and the tests start failing uh, in big numbers, then probably something is wrong with the variables. So you can compare the production variables and your own variables and you can set the variables correctly and then that works like magic and suddenly the tests start working. Uh, you can also take a look on the auto inst log txt which is very important for failures because it basically tells you everything what happens uh, during uh, the test run uh, you can see that uh, you have the blue line here, which basically is the graphical weight login starts here, and this is what happens. So uh, it wanted to check for the needle must match login screen, and at first it didn't find it, it didn't find it, it didn't find it, and didn't find it. Then login screen timed out, and uh, it wasn't found, but because it's, it's check screen, so it was probably correct. Then it wanted to assert the screen, login screen, and uh, then it uh, sort of found it after 10 seconds approximately uh, and uh, continued and continued. Uh, you could also use the DIAC routine to put or print out messages to this auto inst log takes their file. So that might also be the way how you increase the readability of, of the log files if you need. Uh, you can leave comments here, of course. In production, you can put the bug number here and uh, then it shows that the bug has been already created. So uh, on production, you might see that there are little bugs, symbols, 
be just below, you know, or next to not next to a failed test, and you know somebody has already created the bug, and uh, yeah, that's it. Also, what is interesting, you get a nice video of the process, so you can. Yeah, it's quite it's quite uh, fast the video, but uh, it can be slowed down a bit uh, using the using the uh, Firefox menu, yeah. and uh, you can set the speed to uh, zero 05. It still is quite fast in zero 05, but uh, but at least uh, you can see so you can stop it also. But then it's very difficult to find the correct place. But yeah. It can be helpful too. So I think uh, this is this is it. And uh, if you have questions, you can ask. Um, with all that talk about needles, um, I'm missing either a thread or a haystack. <laughs> or to sum it up, why is it called needle? I don't know, to be, to be sincere. Uh, maybe it's because of the haystack, maybe. <laughs> because it finds, it finds uh, small portions of a picture in a big image. Maybe it's because of that. You don't find a haystack? Well, sometimes you do. Uh, uh, you know, um, th there is a strategy well, how you might find a needle in a haystack. Well, in, in, um, to carry on that analogy, um, usually it's uh, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. So the haystack is given, the needle is given. So you do the searching. What do you use for that? A magnifying glass or whatever, or a magnet? But what you're doing here is you define the needle, uh, which is put into the haystack, and then you check whether the needle is there. It's, it's, a, well, weird, the, the it's a weird terminology. Uh, I might. <laughs> <laughs> the haystack, basically, as I understand it, is the PNG file. The needle is the little portion, and both are there. Just uh, the, the one you expect might not be there. Okay. But since you define the needle, you can make it as big as you like. It could be the entire picture. True. And then it's not a needle anymore, is it? Uh, then it's a hammer or something more. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, that's a, that's a very good point, which uh, gives me, which reminds me to tell you this. Uh, the size of the area actually matters, because the bigger it is, uh, the more problematic it will be to find. And uh, sometimes when you have a tiny, <clears throat> a tiny pixel glitch, in the image of the virtual machine, so it won't be found. If it's too big, you will, and you expect 96%, you will have troubles. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, the best strategy is to keep the needles as small as possible. You can, if you need to check for more, you can define more areas inside of the one needle. But the smaller they are, the better for you. On the, on the other hand, of course, I once experienced a case when I wanted to check whether the button was lit or not. So basically, it looked the same. It just would be, it would be a, little, a little bit blacker or with darker shade when off and with a lighter shade when on. And uh, the classical 96% wouldn't be able to cover that because in both cases it would be above 96. So it wouldn't be able to differentiate between off and on. And I had to explicitly make it 100% and only then it was able to distinguish between the states. Uh, so uh, sometimes it's like a, uh, it, it, it's a funny play with those needles. 
It was um, my uh, first comment was, of course, more like a joke and, uh, you know, um, trying to uh, get my question in there. Uh, I totally understand what it's doing and it's very useful uh, um, the way it works. It's just sometimes uh, you, you ask yourself these questions like, how did they come up with that name and why did they use that terminology? Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, uh, it doesn't make sense to me how a chameleon could uh, look at one side and another side uh, at the same time, you know. <laughs> so, uh, is, does this support accessibility testing? Uh, accessibility testing, uh, like, uh, like, like this, for example? Or which accessibility do you mean? So, you, you, the, the calculator test that you ran, if I do it on a high contrast or say a color change mode, can I reuse the test? Or uh, you can you... reuse the test, but you have to recreate the needles. So you could have basically uh, a couple of sets of needles and you could, for example, you could use the calculator test on high contrast, normal contrast, large test, text, you know, and uh, it, it would work. So this is interesting because this is why the needles have the tag concept. So you would have the exact same test logic and you just have three different needles which have the same tag, which all match on the same tag. So we use this a lot. We have lots of cases where we have, you know, different needles that match on the same tag because of various conditions making the screen look different. So that's how you would do that. And basically, just to add to Adam, uh, if you run a test, the calculator test and uh, you have the needles to create, you have created the needles to support the high contrast, for example, or the normal contrast. So it doesn't matter actually which one of the tests will run, both would pass because the needles are there already. So you don't have to tell it, use the high contrast needles. So if the test is high contrast and the needles are there along or next to the normal contrast needles, the test will pass okay. I have a question about, uh, let's say, the target audience for this. So who should be most interested to look into this? Let's say if I am a package manager, a package, packager in Fedora and I have some graphical application in Fedora, should I try to install this and create a test and submit it as a pull request for you? Or uh, is it targeted at me or, or not? Well, I would like to say yes. But uh, the, the question is, do we have space for it? Do we have resources for it? Uh, I believe if that's a single test, for example, uh, a single application is tested, we would have resources to do it. If it's like 100 applications, maybe we don't have the resources because the time to run all the tests is sparse. And uh, so basically, if you are a packager who develops a Fedora application that is part of the installation or heavily used in Fedora and uh, so then I think it's good to make a pull request and write a test or make a pull request and uh, we could take it to our stack and uh, test it, right? Yeah, there are different directions someone could go with this. Uh, as Lucas says, if you want to get a test into the official repositories, before putting too much work into it, it's probably best to file an issue and we can discuss whether that's a test that we would want to carry in the officials. But you can also just stand up your own OpenQA instance, as Lucas has explained, and use it. You can do this kind of permanently. There are, I think there are cases of people doing that. Um, there are other projects which have stood up OpenQA, like GNOME and Debian and stuff. So that's another way you could go with it. Um, but yeah, we do have resource constraints on the official instance, so we have to kind of... I have, for example, compromise. talked to some Red Hat teams uh, about yep. OpenQA. And uh, they said, oh, you know, it looks great, it looks great, but it's too complicated to maintain it. 
Well, actually, I don't think it's too complicated to main, uh, maintain a local instance because it works, it must work. It works for us all the time. So the basic, basic thing is to install it and run it, that's it, you know. N nothing to maintain because it's maintained by Adam. It does take you your 20 minutes to get your initial instance running, but then after that, it, it'll kind of sit there and work. Like, you can have your yeah. pet instance sitting there and not use it for six months, and if you come back and update your system and try and run a test, it'll probably be okay. Yeah. It's not a lot of ongoing maintenance involved. It's there kind of initial setup. But once you've done it once and figured out how to write a test and add it into the templates, it all gets a lot less overwhelming. So it's a kind of a little bit of an initial setup and then a sort of plateau of... And th there is one problem that could actually arise after an upgrade. And that's the Postgres server because sometimes it gets updated and you need to update the database running the specific command. Yeah. If you don't do it, it won't start and then OpenQA won't start. But it's, it's probably pretty... It's like yeah, once or twice maybe, yeah. And, uh, okay, one more Okay, question. so if I understand correctly, I guess this is most uh, interesting to some teams that could be working on some pro bigger projects or some maintainers of some high-profile applications, for, for example, like LibreOffice or something, that yeah. would be interested to be pushed into the like, pro federal production instance, or perhaps some passionate maintainers that want to run their own local instance. Is it correct? Or by anyone in the community who wants to help us uh, creating the tests for Fedora stack. Cool. Thank you very much.